What is up, word of life? Man, I'm telling you, you do not want to miss the next couple of weeks here at Word of Life Church. We've got Chad Veach and the Hope is Here tour coming in on a Thursday night. And the event originally was going to cost around 25 bucks per ticket. But you know what we did? We just bought out the event so that all of you could come for free and bring all of your friends Especially if you've got some young people in your life, you don't want to miss it. We've got Chad Veach that night, Social Club Misfits, Zoe Worship. We're going to have an amazing time. Then we've got Michael Jr. in the house coming up the first Sunday in November. Going to be a huge invite Sunday where we plan to see hundreds come to Christ. And then as you saw, we've got our back to the, 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 the church kind of series where we're looking at at the movies. And we're just going to have a ton of fun showing spiritual truths within movies, making it easy for you to bring your friends. Our goal in the month of November and December is to see 1,500 first-time visitors and over 1,000 salvations to end this decade on a high with ushering in people over into God's presence. And then the first Wednesday in November, you don't want to miss it, we've got one of my favorite preachers coming into the church, Dr. Darius Daniels is going to be in the house house here at Word of Life Church. If you've never heard Dr. Darius preach, I'm, friend, I'm telling you, you want to make sure you are here that night. It is going to be an amazing time. So lots of fun things coming up at Word of Life Church, but we are glad to have you here with us, and not only you, but also everyone who is watching online. We've got Kathy from Goshen, Alabama. We've got Kent from Washington State, and we've got Thomas all the way from Italy, as, long as, as well as many others watching online. Let's give it up for them and everyone else who is watching. Amazing. We're so glad that you were able to tune in with us today. If you brought your Bibles, let's open them up to the book of Genesis this morning. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 13. And we're going to look at the life of Abraham once more. We started this year looking at the life of Abraham, and I plan on ending this year looking at the life of Abraham. Genesis chapter 13, and we'll read verses 14 through 17, and they'll also have it on the screens. Genesis 13 and verse number 14. I like this in the New Living Translation. It says this, after Lot had gone, now that is critical, After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can and see in every direction, north, south, east, and west. Verse 15 says, I am giving all this land as far as you can what? See. If you can see it, I can give it. But if you can't see it, you can't have it. As far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. In verse 16, and I will give you as many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. And finally in verse 17, go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you. One translation says, every place the sole of your foot touches, that I am giving unto you. The title of this message this morning is Three Things You Must Do Before 2020. Three Things You Must Do Before 2020. How many of you know we got a new decade coming up? 2020 to 2030. How many of you are expecting it to be the best decade you have ever had? Amen. I really honestly just plan on seeing that decade, uh, God being able to accomplish more in your lives, in this church, and in my life in that decade than all the decades we have ever lived combined in this coming one. And in order for, for that to happen, I think there are three things you must do before that decade starts. Number one, it is this, let it go. Just, just let it go. Let it go. Pull an Elsa and just let it go pull a mortal combat and just finish it. You know, just let it go. Number two, dream big. Number three, walk through. I wanna talk about these things briefly today to just get it strong in your hearts before we close out this year. Number one, let it go. We saw that God took Abraham as far as he could take him. Up till this point, Abraham's life had been blessed, it had been good, but we know Abraham's original assignment from God was to separate himself from his father's household. We don't know why, 
We just know this is what God wanted. So God speaks to Abraham, and it's recorded in Genesis for every one of us to see. Abraham, separate yourself from your father's house. And he does this to a degree. It's partial obedience. Any of you want ever obeyed partially? It's like, I kind of did it. It's like, I kind of cleaned my room. I kind of took out the trash. Not all the trash. You know, not the inconvenient. Just, you know, some of it. I, I kind of did it. Abraham kind of obeyed God, and he left the bulk of his family, but he took Lot with him. Now, here's what I love about God, is God didn't come in to Abraham and say, you know what, I can't believe you messed up this bad I'll never be able to do anything with you. No, God blessed Abraham as far as he could take him. For there came a moment in Abraham's life where strife was coming up. There were so many issues coming up that Abraham knew it is time to separate myself from Lot. And as soon as Lot was separated from Abraham's life, God spoke to Abraham about greater things. It's the lots in life that keep us from the big things of God. And I know that God wants to do some big things in this coming decade. I believe it is just time for it. It's the season for it. But here's what I also know. If we don't get rid of our lots, God will bless us as far as he can. But there are some things he will not be able to take us into until we get the lots out of our house. What is lot? Anything God has asked you to separate your life from. It could be an app, it could be a person, it could be a habit, it could be unforgiveness, it could be a lot of things, but you're coming to God and saying, in this season, I am moving this out of my life. Over the past couple of weeks, I have seen, literally seen, God do some amazing things in this church and in my family. I had something happen last week that just absolutely just made me just literally just weep before God and just bless his name. There was something I had been praying for for about two and a half years. And in one fell swoop, God just supernaturally just took it out, made it happen, so cool, so amazing. And I came to God and I asked him, I'm like, like, why now? Like, why in this season am I seeing just your mighty hand kind of open some things up? And I honestly was thinking about someone else and just, you know, praying for them too, that God would kind of open up their life and really do some neat things because I knew they were believing God for some things. How many of you ever believe God for something, Right? Like all of us currently, right now, we should be living a life of faith, believing God for some things. And I, I kind of brought them up to the Lord and just said, Lord, you know, I want you to like do some amazing things in their life too. And as I'm praying about this, the Lord just speaks to my heart. And he says, you remember when you were in, in India three years ago? And I said, I, I do. He said, do you remember that service when you were getting up to preach? And right before you were getting up to preach, I spoke to your heart something that just changed what you were going to preach on during that whole conference. I said, I do. He said, do you remember what that was? And I said, I do. And so here's what he told me. They'll put it up on the screens for those of you who like to take notes. For those of you who don't like to take notes, uh, they'll be up there for you to take notes. So put it up on the screens. The Lord spoke this to my heart. Giving and forgiving are the two keys you need to live underneath an open heaven. Giving and forgiving are the two keys you need to live underneath an open heaven. Giving and forgiving. You remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 11? In Mark chapter 11, he's talking about faith and how your faith can move mountains and how when you pray in faith, God can give you the desires of your heart. But did you ever read verses 25 and 26 of that same chapter in Mark chapter 11? It says, and when you stand praying, forgive. Forgiveness keeps heaven open over your life. When forgiveness, you are letting go of wounds. You are letting go of heartache. You are letting go of the pain. Who in your life in 2019 do you need to forgive to live underneath an open heaven in this new decade? But also giving opens up heaven. We know this in the book of Malachi, right? In Malachi chapter three, it talks about this, where God comes to his people and he's like, you've robbed me. And they're like, how in the world have we robbed you? He said, in tithes and in offerings. 
He's like, you're not bringing your tithes and offerings into my storehouse. And he says, look, you need to do that. You need to bring them into the storehouse. You need to prove me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. What is giving, it is letting it go. You remember what God spoke to Abraham in the book of Genesis when he offered up his son Isaac? He says, now that I have seen that you have not withheld or held on to Isaac, but you have let him go, you have offered him to me. Now I know that in blessing I will bless you and in multiplying I will multiply you. Friends, in 2019, we have got to let it go. A number of years ago when we were constructing this building, we had the blueprints and all these things, and I hired my contractor at the same time as my architect so that the whole time my architect was designing, my contractor could tell me how much it was going to cost or give me a rough estimate. Because sometimes you can have these conversations with an architect and be like, oh, this would be cool, and all of a sudden you added $500,000 to a project. So I wanted him there as a safeguard. And we were looking at the building, and my contractor came to me, and he said, you know, in looking at the budgeting, it looks as if in this season, it might be wise for us to not put on the offices and the backstage space, so all of, of the space back here. He says, it's going to cost about $1.2 million in order to do that, and I think that would kind of put us over the budget, so we can plan for it, we can draw it. Uh, you know, and that kind of thing, but we might need to layer that in phases to make sure we stay within our budget. He's like, I need to know how you wanna move forward on this. And, you know, I I went home honestly a little upset and a little dejected because it's like, we need offices and we need the space and we wouldn't have enough places to put employees and already at that point we had employees working everywhere like in all these random nooks and crannies in the church and I'm like we really need that space and I just couldn't let it go in my heart and I knew that God didn't want me to lower my vision to my set of circumstances. How many of you know we serve a God who is bigger than whatever circumstances you may have in your life? And I just couldn't get a release to let go of that. So I called him up and I'm like, no, you know, God's gonna provide for this. And I don't know exactly how or when, but I wanna move forward like we have the provision for it. Well, at that time, a couple of weeks later, I was going to India. And I'm there in India and I'm, I'm having this moment where we're worshiping God and the Lord puts on my heart a missionary in the back of the room. And as they come up in my heart, I know that God wants this church to sow into their ministry $50,000. And I'm like, Lord, like last week, if there be any other way. Like, you know, now's not the time. Now, you know, it's really not convenient. We've got so much money going out, so much money being spent on a building. Now is really not the time. But I couldn't shake it. I knew it was God, and I knew that this was a test to see, like kind of an Isaac moment, are you going to hold on, or are you going to let go? Are you going to keep this from me, or are you going to sow it into my kingdom and believe that as you do this, it opens up the windows of heaven above you? And finally, I told God, I'm like, all right, I'm all in. So I came up to him at the end of the service, I'm like, look, you don't know me, I don't know you, because this was not the guy who brought us in over to India. But I'm like, look, I told him his name was Mark. I'm like, look, Mark, the Lord has put on my heart to give you $50,000. And as I told him this, immediately he starts crying. He brings his wife over. He's like, tell her what you just told me. I'm like, the Lord kind of dealt with my heart to give me, you guys, $50,000. She starts crying. Come to find out they were in line to put on a crusade in Pakistan for that same amount of money. They had been believing God for it, asking God for it, were worshiping God over it in that service that very day. And it just supernaturally met their need. Well, of course, I was so blessed in hearing this, but here's what's funny. About 14 minutes later, I get a ding on my phone because I buy an international plan whenever I go on missions trips. I get a ding from my phone from the financial department saying someone just gave us an $80,000 check. So I'm like, come on, God, already there's a harvest. 
But here's the better news. I, a couple of hours later, I got a text from someone that said, Pastor Joel, we've been praying, and as a corporation, we just feel impressed over the next 12 months for every month for us to sow $100,000 a month, a month into your building, which was exactly $1.2 million, which was exactly what we need to build set offices. Come on, somebody. You got to learn to let it go. You've got to learn to let it go. I don't know what it is, but in 2019, it is the season, it is the time to let it go, to boldly proclaim over our lives, it is finished. God has some things in store. Number one, we got to let it go. Number two, we got to dream big. We got to dream big. How many of you know we serve a God who wants to do some great things in your life? Oh, we serve, he wants to astound you. I mean, literally astound you with his goodness. We preached a message a couple of weeks ago. I want to come back to it because you know what? It's good to be hearers of the word, but you know what's even better than being a hearer? Being a doer of the word. And we said in that message, we said, we want you to get a 10 in 10 to write down a list of God-glorifying goals, 10 things you want to see God do for you and your family over the course of the next 10 years. I want to ask you, have you written some goals down? Have you written some God-glorifying goals down? God is not offended by your biggest desires and dreams. God is offended by anything less God does not want you to live a life in your own power. God wants you to absolutely walk in his goodness. If your prayers are so small, if your prayers are constantly within a span where they're not impossible to to, to you, friend, they're insulting to God. God wants you to move out into something that only God could do for you, only God could do for your church, only God could do with your family. Write down a list of God-glorifying goals. In Abraham's life, his life was good. You read Genesis 12, Abraham's life was good. You read Genesis 13, Abraham's life was good. But you know what God said unto Abraham? He said, lift up your eyes from the place where you are, and I want you to see new territory. I want you to see new things. For everything that you see, that is what I will give you. But if you don't see it, I can't give it. God wants you to marvel at his goodness. In the book of Acts, we see Peter and and John and James walking into a gate called Beautiful. And they see a, a man there just laying by the gate who had not been able to walk since his mother's womb. He had never had the joy of running or playing sports or any of these things. For all of his days, he was just sitting by this gate begging for money. And these men, they walk up to him in Acts 3, and they just say, silver and gold have I none, because he was expecting to receive from them. But they said, such as we do have, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. They asked this big request from God. They asked this this prayer that it was just so knowledgeable of what God was able to do. They weren't afraid to protect God's reputation or afraid to put God on the spot. And you know what God did? He honored that request. And at the end of this, this guy gets up walking and leaping and praising God, and he's holding on to Peter, so much so that everyone comes running to Peter, and he's like, who are you? Like the gods have come down and dwelt among us as men. But I want you to see what Peter wrote here, or what Luke wrote here, what Peter said in Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or our own holiness we have been able to make this man walk? I love this. The God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. I love this phrase, God has glorified his son Jesus. You know what God wants to do in this season? I think he wants to so just reveal himself 
Saul just show himself mighty and strong and powerful and good. Just open up heaven so much in our lives that we can't do anything but sit back and just glorify Jesus. The, the other day, I was in here on Friday, and I walked in the sanctuary, and God just gave me a song to sing over the church. It was just something that just came up in my heart, and I just began to walk around just singing it. You wouldn't have wanted to have been here. How many of you know... Everybody can sing. Everybody can sing. Not everyone should record or hold a microphone, but everybody can sing. Uh, and I just had this song come up for the church. The Bible talks about like songs of power, songs of deliverance. And I just began to sing it. And I finally got a release. I was done. So I went over to the cafe and I began to pour me a shot of espresso because uh, I love coffee. Uh, and uh, I'm there pouring the shot and I, I, I'm done with it. And I start walking away. And just so gently, the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, buy your wife pumpkins. I'm like, what? Yeah, I'm like, buy your wife pumpkins. I'm like, pumpkins? Pumpkins. Buy your wife pumpkins. I'm like, okay, I'll buy her some pumpkins. Like, I'm, I don't even know, where do you get pumpkins? Like, I don't, I don't know where pumpkins, where do, you, where do you go for pumpkins? It's like, pumpkin pie, I know where that is, but pumpkins. And I just had that so big in my heart. So I call her up and I'm like, look, she, I called up. She said, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just walking around the church praying. What are you doing? She says, well, I'm just, you know, getting ready for the weekend, all those types of things. She's like, what'd you call for? I'm like, the Lord put it on my heart to buy you pumpkins. And I was gonna go just buy you pumpkins, but I thought maybe you'd like to pick out your own pumpkins. Like, because I don't know where to start with this. Silence on the other end of the phone. Silence. Silence. And I'm like, okay. And I hear her crying. She's like, an hour ago. An hour ago, I was standing on my front porch saying, Father, I would really like some pumpkins. I really want some pumpkins out here by the front door. And she said, I didn't want to ask you about them because we've been in this season where God has had us giving a lot, like a lot, a lot. So I told my wife, I'm like, look, you know, this was weeks ago, like a spending freeze, if you will. Uh, like, you know, holidays are coming up, all those types of things. So she was living with that, and she's like, I, I didn't want to ask you for it, but she said, I knew God could make a way. So I knew I didn't have to ask you. I knew I had someone else. Else I could ask. How many of you know you have somebody else you can ask? So she asked God for pumpkins. She said, I'm just in awe of Jesus. I'm like, what about your husband who heard from Jesus? <laughs> but it's the truth in that moment. Like, God cared about her wanting pumpkins. Do you know God cares about you wanting pumpkins? Oh, come on, God cares about your kids' grades. He cares about world peace. He cares about starving children, but he cares about pumpkins too. You know why? You're the apple of his eye. You're his daughter. You're his son. And you know what he wants? He wants to bring those moments into our lives where we stand back and we just glorify Jesus, where we just stand back and say, isn't Jesus awesome? Isn't God wonderful? Isn't our Father such a good provider? But you know what? God can't do that unless you see it and ask for it. God moves where faith puts them, and we have not because we ask not. I want you to ask. Dreaming is praying on paper. Goal setting is praying on paper. When you're writing those things down, you are offering a petition to the living God. And I want to encourage you, write down a list of 10 God-glorifying goals for the next 10 years. And finally, number three, I want to close with this one. Number three, I want you to walk through the land. Walk through the land. Walk through the land. Let it go. Write down some big goals. And number three, walk through the land. Walk through the promise. Walk through the goals. A number of years ago, I had a moment in my, my prayer life that really changed the way that I prayed. And basically what happened was, is I'm in uh, this, this season of life where I was missing my father. Like my father passed away when I was 17. And one of the things that he loved was right before he passed away, he bought a Corvette. Uh, so it was like a, a 2000 uh, Chevrolet Corvette coupe, you know, that kind of thing. 
And uh, we sold that car when he passed away because, you know, you sell a lot of stuff when that happens because you don't want to be reminded of those people every time you turn around, that kind of thing. Anyway, I wanted it back. But the, the problem was is I didn't know where it was and I didn't know how to find it. But I did know I had a God who cared. And so I, I came to God and I'm like, you know my heart, Father. That car meant a lot to my father. And out of that, I'm not a car guy like at all, but it means something to me and I'd like to have that part of him. And I came to God and I wrote that down and I began to pray for it. Well, time went by and uh, sometimes you gotta be prepared to wait because it's with faith and patience we inherit the promises. And I just forgot about it. You ever had that happen to you? I just forgot about it. And it wasn't that it didn't matter to me, it's just I forgot about it. And honestly, I didn't even know how it would be possible. Like, even if I had the money, what in the world I would do to, like, you know, find it, find the vehicle. And one night I went to sleep, and I had a dream. And in the dream, this was like a span of like a year and a half later, I have a dream, and in the dream, I see the Corvette pull up. And I knew it was my father's Corvette because on the back of the Corvette, there was a sticker that had prepaid legal on it. There was this company called Prepaid Legal. And it was just letting every police officer know, when you pull me over, I am fighting this. Like, I am taking this to court. I've already paid for an attorney. Uh, so, like, he had it at the back of the thing. It never helped. Uh, and uh, anyway, I saw that sticker. I'm like, that's his car. And I saw this guy come out of the car with car keys, and he handed them to me. And the Lord spoke to me in the dream and said, you didn't know how close you were to it when you gave up on it. You didn't know how close you were to it when you gave up on it. I'm like, oh. So immediately I woke up. I knew it was God speaking to me. And so I'm like, I'm getting in faith for that car. I got in faith for that car. Kid you not, a couple of days later, I was talking to a guy, and he said, you know what? If you ever wanted to find a car, I know the perfect way to do it. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, why are we even talking about this? He's like, all you'd have to do is call your insurance agent. Your insurance agent, whoever insured that car, if they insured it, would have the VIN number. And he said, if you know the VIN number, then I can go and look through a database and be able to pull up whoever owns the car. I'm like, are you serious? And I'm like, kid you not. I'm like, I don't know why we're having this conversation right now, but there is actually a car I'm looking for. And he's like, well, call your insurance agent. So I called my insurance agent. Sure enough, they had the VIN number because this is the same insurance agent that I've used for years. I had the VIN number. I gave it over to him. A day later, I knew who owned the car. I find out that guy's information. I call him up on the phone and I'm like, do you own a Chevrolet Corvette? And he said, do, did you see the ad in the paper? It's a true story. I said, no, I didn't see the ad in the paper. Uh, he's like, yes, it's been for sale for over a year and a half. He said, I just sold it two days ago. I'm like, oh, my word. You got to be kidding me. So I told him the back story. He's like, son, I'm an older man. I've had that car for years. I never drove it. He said, the, the truth is, if you had called me and told me this, he said, I so wish you would have. I'd have given you the car. He gave me the name of the person he sold it to, and I wound up buying it for the same price that that guy paid for. But here's the thing. Hey, man, that, yeah, that's a great story. That's a great story. But here's what I learned from that. It could have been given to me, but I gave up on it. God had it in motion, was saving it for me because he knew I'd wanted it, but I gave up on it. It taught me a lesson taught me a lesson. Jesus talked about the power of prayer by telling a story about a woman who was unjustly done. And she comes to the judge day after day after day after day after day after day about the same request over and over and over and over and over and over again. She comes to the judge and says, avenge me of my adversary. Finally, the judge gets so tired of it, he's like, look, just give her what she asked for. Just get her out of this court. And Jesus says, well, I find faith like that on the earth when I come back. Day after day after day after day. Did you ever read the Battle of Jericho, how they just circled that city? Day after day after day after day. Did you know that was not an uncommon military practice? That oftentimes when it came to walled cities, it was not just, okay, boys, suit up, get your armor, get your shield, get your sword, get your spear, and attack these walls. You know what they would do with a walled city? They would just circle it. 
And every day, just watch it. We're not going to let any life into this. We're going to so surround it that no life will be able to come out of it and no life will be able to go into it. And if they want to come out and fight us, we're more than open for a fight. But until then, day after day, I'm just going to be sitting here drinking my espresso, sitting here watching these walls, sitting here making sure no life is coming in or out. I'll be here tomorrow morning and the next morning and the next morning and the next morning until finally the enemy would just say, look, we can't get any life in. We can't get any life out. Let's just go ahead and surrender, and they would walk on out. Now, here's my point. You know, oftentimes in prayer, we like have these moments of faith where we like beat down Jericho's walls, and we get suited up after a message, and it's like, ah, I'm so filled with faith, and I just begin to attack these walls. But did you know sometimes steady faith just gets the job done? That morning after morning after morning, you see something in life and it's like, it's okay, I'll be here tomorrow morning drinking my espresso, talking to God about this enemy. And I'll be here the next morning and I'll be here the next morning and I'll be here the next morning because here's what I know. If I circle Jericho enough, one day a shout's gonna bring these walls down. This year, I'll give you some things. This year, I had 43 mark-offs, 43 things I wanted to see God do this year, 43 things. So far, year's not over. I got 29 of them marked off. Amen. And here's how I go about doing it. And I learned this from that moment of having that dream. I keep a prayer journal. And in the prayer journal, here's what I'm doing. I'm writing down the things that I've said to God, and I'm writing down the things that God is saying to me. And every morning I wake up, I open that prayer journal and I look at those things and I walk through the land. I walk through my promises. I walk through it and I see it done. I walk through that land and I call it done. I walk through that land and I see those walls falling. I walk through those, that land and I see those bodies healed, those people saved. I walk through that land and I see God moving in our church. I see miracles. I see things happen. I walk through that land. And you know what? I see it so oftentimes in my heart that oftentimes it's only a matter of time before I see it in my life. But it all comes from day after day. I'll see you in the morning. I'll see you in the morning. And in life, I'll see things that don't look like they're ever going to change. But it's like, it's okay. Next morning, I'll be right here with my coffee and my promises and my God circling my city because I know these walls are going to fall. I'll give you one for the church this year. It's one of my bigger mark-offs, one of my bigger goals. We started this year with $8.5 million of of debt remaining on an $18.5 million facility. I told God in 2019, I want that in the sixes. It can be 6.9, it can be 6.98, it can be 6.97, but I want it in the sixes. So I began to get in faith for that because it would be like covering all of our normal expenses, giving like we give, which is crazy giving all over the world, giving like we give, all of those types of things, we would still need about $1.6 million extra to come in. And at the start of this year, build the giving to the building dropped off the face of the earth. I'm like, oh my gosh, we got in the building and people stopped giving to the building. I'm like, what in the world are we going to do about this? And I'm looking at all these things in the natural. But I told God, it's okay. I'll see you in the morning. I'm going to circle this promise. I'm going to circle this city. And by the end of this year, you know what we saw while giving to the building was down and those types of things by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Our overall giving this year was up over 12% even with that from the last year. And not only did we get that thing into the sixes, we got it into the fives by the mighty hand of God. Walking through a promise, day by day, seeing my promised land, sending out the spies, come back and tell us what God's doing in the land, coming back and shouting around those walls, what's your Jericho? What promise are you circling? What do you wanna see God do in your life, in your family? You keep circling, God will keep sending his power. Walls will fall. Walls will fall. 
Now this year, one of our big projects that we have, even as a church, and this is how it happens. I want you to do, just like we do it as a church, we do as an example for you to do it in your personal life. But here's the thing, up till now, all of these promises I've been circling. But the Lord has been dealing with myself to humble myself before him and before you and say, you know what, I crave your faith. I crave your faith. That I believe if we can come together and use our faith for the same things corporately, it'll go beyond even what we could use our faith for individually. And we've got some walls we wanna see fall, some things we wanna see marked off. They'll throw some of these things up on the screen. They'll put the first, our parking lot and grounds all over our church. We need new parking, especially in the bays. Now we've used our faith and we've done it at the entryways and I've used my faith and we've done it around the church. But I want us collectively as a congregation to use our faith to see our bays filled with two more inches of asphalt. And all honesty, our parking lot now is a modern day miracle. That stuff has been out there for 20 years with only two inches on it and it has served as well. But it's time for it to go and for some new asphalt to come in. And in order for that to happen, we need $500,000 or specifically $499,676. That's $95 a ton. I want you to mark that off. I want you to put it on your prayer list and say, Father, these things will be marked off. Next, they'll put it up. Uh, our, our other project in phase two, or, or the next one, that's the building. Uh, we'll skip that one. Go to the kids' life. In the kids' arena, what we wanna do is we wanna make our kids' space better than ever. I mean better than ever. Most people come to Christ under the age of 16 which means we wanna get them while they're young. How many of you know if you can train up a child when they're young, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. The, the remodel that we did in our children's church, we wanna take it all throughout the church, and all throughout the children's church, in the hallways, in the four and six year old room. In order to do that, we need about $200,000. Now here's the thing, I know without a shadow of a doubt, by this time next year, those projects will be done. They will be absolutely completed. But what if we could see a miracle and see them done by the end of this year? What if we came together collectively as a congregation and say, by the hand of God, we will see what should have taken a year happen in two months. That God, by your grace and by our collective faith, we can see walls fall, we can see mountains move, we can see God break forth his goodness in the land of the living. Now here's how simple this is. If we had 2,500 people, which we have way more than that in the house and watching online, but if we had 2,500 people make a decision to give $280 by the end of this year on top of their regular ties, $280 per person, we could see this project supernaturally knocked off by the hand of God. So here's what I want you to do. I want you as one of your goals by the end of this year to say, you know what? I'm gonna believe God before the, the month of December, I'm gonna believe God for $280. Some way, somehow, God is going to manifest his goodness and bring $280 into my life. And come Christmas time, let's all sew it together and let's see what God can do in our church. Let's see what God can do in our life. Because here's the thing, it's not about the money. That will eventually happen. You know what it is? It's about the faith of a living God in my life and in your life. Let's watch walls fall, amen. Let me pray for you today. Father, we love you so much. And I thank you for each and every person who is in this place. And Father, what we ask today is to see your goodness and to see your power in the land of the living. Father, we know you wanna glorify yourself. Father, we know you want us to see your glory to discover your power. And Father, what I ask is just like Peter launched out into the deep and let his nets down and he caught more fish than he had ever caught before. Came back and fell down on his knees and marveled at your goodness and grace. That we have those same kind of moments in our families. That we have those same kind of moments in our church that we have those same kind of moments in our homes. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for it. With heads bowed all over this place, before we leave, 
I know it's the 830 service. I know it's fall. I know the fair is going on. But maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Joel, I'm going to come to Jesus. I need mercy. I need grace. I want a fresh start. Right now, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. No one's looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to draw attention to you. But I do want you to make a decision before your father to come home. And if that's you today, you want that mercy, you want that grace, you want that fresh start, would you do something for me right now? No one's looking, just the Lord. Would you just lift your hand and surrender to the Lord Jesus today all over this building? Hands going up, hands going up, hands going up. Amazing, 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 amazing. Father, I ask that you meet your people right where they are at right now with your mercy and your grace. Everybody in here, just say this prayer with me. Let's say it together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in Jesus. I believe in you and I confess Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Jesus, what you did on the cross paid for my sins, paid for my mistakes, paid for my failures. And today, Father, I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. Today, Father, I forgive myself And I say, this is the beginning of the best days of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to subscribe to the link if you haven't already for more weekly content that I'm sure is going to be a blessing to you as well. Click the link below if you would like to partner with us to help us get this message out to even more people. Thank you so much for your generosity. We'll see you next week.